Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications, and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. Welcome back everyone to Balls Security Weekly. Oh, my teleprompter was, was, was stuttering there a little bit. Uh, if you've got a specific guest or topic, didn't we do that one already? We did that. We did that one already. Do we have any other announcements? Top of this segment? Do we? Oh, yeah, we, we do. We, nope, uh, we don't. We do a webcast coming up. Uh, it is a completely uh, free webcast. Uh, it is not sponsored. So this is a new webcast series that we're doing. Uh, under the Security Weekly Unlocked umbrella. So these Security Weekly Unlocked webcasts will only ask for your name and email address. And I basically am not sharing that with anyone. And I'm just using that to email you like stuff related to the webcast you attended. Uh, so you give your name and email. And the first one that we'll be doing as a Security Weekly Unlocked webcast is called Do It Yourself. Build Building a Home Security Lab with Adrian Sanabria, Tyler Robinson, Mike Shima, and myself where we'll give you some uh, tips and tricks for setting up your home security lab. It is completely free. You can go to, oh, and uncovering spies, validating vulnerabilities within applications with Kevin Johnson, Josh Marpet, and myself on February 16th. Uh, we've got do these five things to catch more bad guys with Doug Burks and myself. Again, these are all free. They are not sponsored. Name and email address. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register today. Fantastic. Love the graphics on those. Awesome stuff. Uh, let's see. Where do we want to start with uh, the stories for this week? There's let's a lot start. of good ones in here. Yeah, let's, start <laughs> easy. let's start easy. Moxie Marlin Spike. Uh, it, the, I think the article is a bit sensationalized. This one, I think, came from the register, who I respect... Known for a little bit of sensational uh, sensationalization, I should say. Um, most of us know Moxie and you know of Moxie, right? And I think the title goes Moxie Marlin Spike quits as CEO. Like I don't think he was like like screw you guys, I'm I'm quitting. Like it wasn't an Antonio Brown kind of quitting situation. I don't know if you've seen the memes on that or what, caught that caught that video. It was like one of the most epic ways to quit a job ever. Um, in any case. Uh, Moxie has so what I got from the article was and what I think happened as an outlook I have no I haven't talked to Moxie about this or, or any sources uh, at signal but Mo, just knowing Moxie um, and the signal project I think Moxie was like look we're at a point where I can step down like you've created this really cool private and secure messaging application we built in some cool cryptocurrency, which they get knocked for, which we get to in a minute. And he's like, I don't think he was challenged. That's my guess. Look, I, again, I haven't talked to Moxie, but I think he was like, there's really like not much more for me to do here. It's not challenging for me. You guys got this. He's probably going to go, if I know Moxie and, and listen to his Joe Rogan interview, and he's been on this show, right? He's probably going to go do a bunch of sailing and, and chill out and relax for a while. Uh, and maybe come back and, and do another really like cool thing. That's that's my guess. Again, pure yep, speculation. I, but that's how how I, I see it unfolding. I, I, I'm with you, Paul, especially on the uh, I, I I've done all I can here. Yeah. Like Yeah. You, good for him. I think this. it's great. This is, this is good. And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go sail for a little bit. Mm. I, I might actually spend, you know, a couple maybe my more than five hundred hours on a boat this time. Yes. But. <laughs> Please, Moxie. Buy yourself a decent yeah. boat to go sailing. To go sailing in, be safe. I think. Please. A, I think a lot of that was just people voicing their disapproval with, uh, you know, one way or another with where the company was going. And I don't think the I don't think the two are synonymous or tied together. Hey, the article it is an said, interesting pivot, though. Someone says that uh, by tying itself to a specific blockchain currency, um, it is muddles the morality of the product. I, that's a stretch, certainly. I that's mean, a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it's an it's an interesting idea, and honestly, like if you're trying to be something more than just a, an end encryption, uh, a free end end encryption app, you know, you look at you look at some of the other encryption apps that have were free and now have went to you know uh, wicker being one is now a, a government platform that is yep. used and, and a commercial platform so you know yes it's very popular yes it's used widespread but if you're going to pivot and try and make some sort of monetary value out of this uh that's an interesting pivot and it makes sense kind of with their their whole ethos i i'm not sure i would completely agree with you know, I, I love the idea. I don't know if I would integrate the two as you know a single app, but I, I think they coincide and work well as as what they're trying to obtain from an encryption standpoint. Mm. Is that was that the goal of the the cryptocurrency is to help fund Signal rather than going down the corporate route or asking people to to pay for? I that's what I that's what I was thinking. Like as I was seeing them do it, like it made sense. They're one, they're trying to get an end-to-end encryption um, payment system, right? Like their whole thing is it's end-to-end, like point-to-point, hard to trace, you know what you're doing. So I think that makes sense, but I think the side game to that is, yeah, they don't have to go the route of Wicker. They have a huge support, and if they went from a free platform uh, and everybody has jumped to it, it's very well known in Mm. even the non-security space to something that you have to pay for, People would probably pay for it, but there would be a lot of people that would um, give them a hard time, I think. And so I think right. this was a way to do two, you know, an interesting product and development uh, endeavor as well as fund something so they don't have to go commercial. But that was my take. Mobile coin is not a bad idea. It no. is just – it is an interesting thing to integrate um, – <laughs> integrate – a communication platform and a, a mobile payment platform, but yeah, but how Facebook about, payments, WhatsApp payments, like all of them do it. So right, and I mean now you can bundle your antivirus software with some cryptocurrency mining as well. Oh I mean, why not? Gosh. <laughs> that was so amazing. That was probably my favorite article of the week. Freaking Norton, like that's some balls to try and pull this off. But no, it's not. It's not enabled by like if I download, not that I would, if, but if I download Norton antivirus. I have to go enable this crypto. It's mining Monero, I believe. If you just if it's mining Ethereum, Ethereum. But if you rather. just in, if you install by default the what is it the antivirus 360, which comes bundled with a lot of like certain software downloads, like Chrome used to come with it. Mm. Um, it it doesn't disable it from what I from what I've read. Uh, I think okay. they may have changed the default installs, but yeah, you do still have to opt in. But as part of that opt in, like I'm not sure how clear that was as part of the install. Right. Uh, but they only they only take eighty five percent or no that was it they no. take they, uh, they take fifteen they take fifteen fifteen percent you get to keep eighty five percent of that mining but you know the cost of power and and the rigs that you're using okay. to mine this Ethereum um, you're you're definitely negative numbers at that point yeah so they're getting well, a free fifteen they're not you are they're not. <laughs> They're not. You know, they're it's skipping brilliant. 15% off the top of God knows how many computers. And it's Avira and Norton. And, uh, oh, and uh, Dimitri on uh, Discord. Get on Discord. Sorry, I'm a rant on that. Uh, owned by the same parent company. Um, and as for Moxie, uh, I've heard somebody say, and I don't know how true this is, that Moxie is getting close to a billion dollars to have done that. <clears throat> I mean, if they did it just for an end-to-end payment a uh, 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 system like you mentioned tyler that's that's an interesting point i didn't think about that that's valid but i mean it's yeah. effectively it's it's the equivalent of a vc going hey you've got 70 million users let's monetize that user base mm-hmm. or or is it because because this is a the a, an interesting new blockchain and cryptocurrency right you're trying to come up with a way to do payments like this is a, a full featured app now that has you know we've got stickers and, and gifts in the damn thing so um if we're trying to do that why don't we try and do that securely how do we do that securely we have to go blockchain right if we're going to do blockchain why aren't we just offering a coin and, and integrating a coin into the app like logically I, I can see both sides of this but logically this still this still has all the makings of a a decent idea that provides a service that is otherwise unreachable by a lot of users. There's not a lot of users that are going to go and find a way to do difficult-to-trace payments and end-to-end encryption payments. That's just 
not what they do, but they already have signal and they've already adopted it. So why would we not start venturing down that route? So I, I can kind of see the argument on both sides of this. It's not going to go good for law enforcement and uh, people that are going to have a, a conniption about not being able to analyze the, the blockchain and trace some of this stuff um, like they're doing with other chains and coins and exchanges. But I think it's an interesting trend, though, when we talk about Norton antivirus uh, mining cryptocurrency. Even I mean, even if you get some money from that, that I mean, we might not do it on the show, listening to the show, but I bet you there's a lot of people that would. Right? Well, if you've seen six dollars a day or six dollars, it's probably equivalent to about figuring some rough math. You're talking a new i7. If you're doing it with CPU or just some off the shelf GPU, you're talking about six bucks a month, maybe seven. Mm. Your cost for power because you're you're mining Ethereum, you're not getting a huge break on that. Your cost for um, proof of proof of work and the amount of power it took to do that, you're about negative forty seven cents just with rough calculations in my head. Doing a lot of mining these days, so the the, uh, yeah, the, net the negative other one too is, is bad. That, like the, the other one too doesn't like antivirus make your computer slower i mean that was always the joke like you put antivirus in your computer it was always a little slower like yeah now it's antivirus really and mining. Mining yeah. slower oh the, the mining the mining is going to take a lot of cycles but if, it, if it's just sitting there it's, it's very similar to what like nice hash does right like okay you got a computer here with a decent video card in it like my laptop it can it can mine you know 20 bucks a month if it's just sitting here while, while i'm not using it why would i not take that 20 bucks a month which is you know over 200 dollars a year and I'm getting something out of it um, if it makes sense. But the power on this, like people are going to see it. it. Money's going to their wallet. They get six bucks a month for doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes sense from an end user consumer standpoint, but they don't really think about the, the continual wear and tear and the power utilization that's going into that. Not to mention the well, work on the grid. You do this across millions of computers. The load on the grid already, like mining in general, is is killing yeah. the grid. Like it's hard for me to find. Wait, do I make more if I have months. if I have an RTX thirty ninety? Do I make more money? Per yeah, day? you you make uh, you make quite a bit mm. uh, with an RTX thirty ninety. We have one of those too for exporting mm -hmm. video. Sounds like we need to do some mining on it. <laughs> it's just sitting there. Just sitting there on the weekends. I mean, we're not here. Just saying. Yep. <laughs> Be awesome. What else? Oh, what, Larry, you had a couple of stories that uh, I really wanted to talk about. Uh, we had some uh, net USB bug. Yes, you can't go without that one. That one's cool. This one just sounded like a really bad idea when you read the intended purpose of a net USB. So it enables remote devices to connect to routers over IP and access any USB devices just as if they're plugged into your computer. I mean, what could they're very common. like, like uh, a poor a poor man's NAS, as it were, it was right? Printer, right? speakers, webcams, flash drives, other peripherals, hmm. scanners. Hmm. Scanners is a common one that I see. Printers is a common one that I've seen this used with. Um, there's some other interesting. Uh, what was the other one? There was uh, a couple devices that people were. We're using that this was really common and it was a common protocol they had some uh, repos around it i was trying to find other things that use this protocol but uh it it's pretty bad because one of the ways that you know back in 2014 a lot of the nation states would hide their tracks it's gotten a lot harder to hide you know unless you have a botnet or you're passing stuff through cloud flares that are you know unattrib hardware and and offshore accounts and you know, fake companies, it, it gets very difficult to do some of the uh, bigger operations. But the way they were doing it was uh, poning a lot of routers and leveraging uh, like essentially a private proxying uh, to pass traffic through these home routers through different IPs. And it was all with inside of memory. The router would reboot. Um, they sometimes install persistence, sometimes not. They just keep a list of them and they would leverage these devices to spin up infrastructure on demand that was unattributed and uh, ran in memory and this is very similar to how they're doing it with with these is rce for a device for kernel level access that you can establish ip rules in memory that doesn't leave a trace and and can't be attributed later that's how i could see this going very very bad for these devices it's been a while since we've seen 
a kernel level RCE for this number of devices. Scary. What else we got? Scary. You want to talk about uh, Larry's uh, the Apple story door lock? Yeah, Lee, you and I had this one uh, sort of in common. What is door door lock? <laughs> so, uh, if uh, your house you again? are using Apple's HomeKit, and uh, you uh, name a device in your HomeKit you know, setup um, something over five hundred thousand characters um, <laughs> when participating with HomeKit uh, and your iPad or your iOS device, um, uh, but below uh, fifteen out fifteen two and below to fourteen seven, um, and maybe lower. Uh, sees that device ID and there's a, a, an overflow, the device crashes, uh, reboots, and uh, effectively becomes a brick because that is stored somewhere on the device and every time it finds it in HomeKit, even though you've shut the device down or changed the name back, uh, it mm -hmm. continues to effectively reboot. So it's kind of like a permanent denial service. Yeah. So if, wait, if, if someone can change the name of one of my devices, it's a denial service on that device? Not just there. Because there's, there's a variant where it gets in and because of the, the connection to iCloud where information is shared, you can wind up locking yourself out of iCloud and your you know iTunes account. Oh, so it um, locks me in a home kit entirely. And my Apple yeah, ID? Yeah. yeah. And that's bugger. a pain in the ass to reset. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Yeah, Apple's a wicked pain in the ass to... It is so bad. Before that, oh, God. Yeah. I deal with that with my family from time to time. <laughs> So there's, you know, you, you need to, somebody has to get you to, to run a, uh, an app that does this. You have to get to, you know, trick you into running stuff. But we know that's not that hard. And the really good news is it's fixed in the, the iOS 15.2.1 update that came out today. Um, so, yay, we can update. But it's, it was that's actually kind of a cool, a cool, cool hack. I mean, I don't know who figured out. Five hundred thousand characters. Someone did some fuzzing. No, yeah, someone awesome. fell asleep on their keyboard. All right. <laughs> the cat. The cat did. But similar to to kind of the Mac OS vulnerability also came out the the PowerDir one uh, from Microsoft. Microsoft uh, disclosed something to you, Apple uh, that had the uh, the privilege escalation via was it TCS TCSS. Yeah, one of the uh, privacy protection modules in Correct. in Mac OS. That one was pretty interesting as well. There was a, there was a write up on the the door lock by Trevor Spinolos, Spino which is kind of interesting. Goes deep into it. I forgot to put a link to it in there. I'm an idiot. Um, I'll have to go back and add that. But it is kind of cool um, to see what what could be done. Well, and. Uh, you know, we can also talk about NAS. I wound up with three NAS stories because of the the break. Um, oh, Q QNAP one is is really 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 bad. I've dealt with it and uh, looked for some stuff and and honey potted some stuff. It's it's pretty bad. <laughs> to repeat it, it after me, I will never expose NAS to the internet. <laughs> Even even the local network though is is even too scary for me. Like I, I went to I a a second NIC and a private network off of a jump post because the NAS just scares me. There's just so much functionality and they're super cool. You can do a lot with them. They're freaking amazing oh, for yeah. what they can do. But there's so there's so many features and so many apps and Docker containers and and just things in there that can become vulnerable it is so hard to keep up to date on those it's it's a scary device i think but i think that's a really interesting class of devices that suffers from like the microsoft word feature explosion that because mm -hmm. when i make if i'm making a nas i want people to be able to use whatever protocol and methods they want to put files on there do file sharing do music streaming some overloading the firmware basically Doctors, virtual machines yeah. firewalls VPNs, like yeah i'm doing crazy. all putting all these features in this firmware and we all know that's a bad idea like you can't yeah. put all that stuff on there and expect it to be secure and still have it be the small light nimble little operating system and firmware 
it just doesn't happen. We've seen it with Drobo. We've seen it with QNAP. We've seen it with Synology. 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 Has, I mean, they've all had their share of vulnerabilities because they're just trying to pack too much code in there and make it yeah. accessible and usable. Well, and, and that's often the downfall. And the users still have to update them, right? Like the user, yep. there's some auto update features, but still the users, a lot of these devices don't always have always on internet access or they're not always being updated because it you have to reboot it you have to turn on auto updates you have to update and there's still default mm -hmm. things like admin admin accounts that uh, are vulnerable to like password sprays and brute force like they don't have lockouts because that's their only mechanism of entry because the regular user doesn't know how to ssh to them so they don't lock those accounts down so and god forbid you brick your device in an update like i did oh my gosh <laughs> Yeah. And you're soldering shit onto the board to get back into it. It's horrible. It's horrible. So that I mean, even just you, but know, you read about that on the internet, and you're like, oh my god, I'm never applying a firmware update to my my NAS ever again because if I brick it, like I'm screwed because there's no monitor, mouse, and keyboard on the thing. Well, and and it stores so much so much vital information. Like you think about all the drives that you've wiped and in, the info you've pushed over to your NAS, like. There's some sensitive info. There's some important info. Things you probably can't get back, and <laughs> and the like fact. Well, oh my gosh! I and the fact that you, <laughs> I, I don't even know. And I can't remember what I'm saying. <laughs> what and oh and your cryptocurrency wallet was on. Yeah, uh, you, know, you probably USB should never drive. back that up. Man. That was a USB drive. <laughs> you backed that up on your NAS that dies. Yeah, uh, but those NASs are huge, right? Like, so you everyone says backup, backup. Okay, that's just like why doesn't anybody have backup? Backups actually very difficult to do well. Yeah, you're right. Where like, you're de yeah. you're deduping, you're doing a good job of it. You've got redundancy in the backup solution itself, and you're protecting the backups. And a lot of that work's being pushed to a NAS. And a NAS, you know, we said that a there's vulnerabilities, but b you're putting you know maybe 18 terabytes of data. If those drives die in a firmware update. That's a lot of really important data. So they're scary in so many ways that, like, I think they are a, a problem that we're just starting to see issues with, especially yeah. with like ransom. I think you need two two NASs. Uh, I mean, to Dragos's point in the previous segment, right? Two NASs yeah. and some glacier storage. <laughs> that's that's your yeah. strategy. <laughs> and I mean, looking at what's going on with these NASs, not just security issues, but reliability issues with all of these devices. I would, I'm almost leaning towards going back and reading about trying to build it myself and, and build computers with a couple drives and having a couple of computers with some drives, and that's your backup. I've, I've went back to open NAS and, and free NAS, and both yeah. of the, the projects are very well maintained, and, and they're doing some cool stuff with that that allows a lot more redundancy and, and leeway. But again, you, you talk about not even just that, but you start to think about hard drive failures. Like A lot of the hard drives that we're, we've been relying on for backups, at least myself, I've been relying on for backups – you know, they're only uh, they're only shelf life and, and use life for three to five years. Yep. Like so, I don't have that in my disaster recovery plan or even security plan to change those drives out every three to five years. Like I'm not really thinking about that. Yeah, I want to upgrade, but it's not always first priority. I think you're better off buying a, a blade server on you know eBay or many of the sites that you can buy that stuff pretty cheap, and yet yeah, it's, it's older. But you know, I've got an old IBM blade server. It had a rate array. I mean, it was a pain in the ass. Supports rate fifty. Yeah, but rate like 50. I can still pop a drive out and pop a new one in. I can still order drives that are compatible with it, and it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, your cost is probably that of what you'd pay for a NAS. You buy a couple of those, and I mean, the problem with those, so what people Power. I think, yes, what people like about the NAS is you buy that are purpose built for that. They're small. They're quiet. They don't draw a ton of power, and they make it easy for you to you know swap the drives in and out. They can look nice on your, your Instagram picture where you have your, your MacBook, your yep. your iPad, and, and your, your Drobo. phone, and your Drobo. Yep. And, and they all match, and, and it's all white in your in your background. Right, <laughs> right. Well, in the last oh, couple of years, people have upgraded their home internet. Why aren't they – why not just use cloud storage for the average home users? How much storage do they need, you know, versus the risk mm -hmm. of getting the NAS? I would say even, even my grandma is up to multiple terabytes and – you start to think of some of the cloud storage, and right. I don't know. I mean, I have one What's solution for backups and one solution for file storage. They're both not local, and they're I'm doing fine. I got hmm. I got a bunch of crap I should weed out, but I don't have to. I'm not out of room yet. I wonder what the total cost of ownership and like your return on investment timeline is for for something like that, where it's scalable and 
and non-failable. Depends on the amount of electricity you spend on it. Um, My dad runs two Drobos and he backs them up to each other. Yeah, uh, and they're uh, the Drobos are actually pretty good, and there's a lot of uh, free NAS and things like that that are very very useful and very very small, like not incredibly like I'm not running a full on monster server or whatever to do that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and you know QNAP is a problem, but I mean, yeah, everything's got problems. That's why you lock things in segments. Yeah, and they I- do have really good advice, though. That is one thing. Like if you look through how to lock it down, it is almost verbatim how i locked mine down it is it's really? pretty good they didn't go they didn't go to the private you know private separate nick and and walled garden uh network off of the jump box but other than that the the guidance that they gave on the the recent uh, article for how to protect against the qnap ransomware was really well done and actually followed a lot of really good guidance hmm. well, good for them Uh, the Microsoft RDP uh, one is interesting. Or yeah, the, this was from CyberArk uh, researchers. Yeah, we we uh, we did something very similar to this many years back, and they they've kind of taken this to the next level. That uh, you essentially are able to man in the middle uh, the RDP clipboard and well the RDP clipboard process and take over the GUID of the name pipe that that. Um, process is is use, using it's the the TSV TSV C pipe I think it's a a pipe that connects uh, remote desktop services to the RDP clip and the attacker can get uh, a a GUID that's not unique um, and is the same for that process that starts it they can restart that process take over that GUID basically we take over the man in the middle uh, named pipe between remote desktop and uh, the clipboard. And so they can essentially see everything in clear text happening across that remote desktop uh, service and, and between different users and even... So um, wait, so this is like there's a computer and someone's RDP'd into that computer. I RDP or gain access to that computer and I can see that RDP session, everything is happening. Yeah, so think, think of probably in, in a more real-world scenario, a terminal server, right? Mm-hmm. Like multiple users are RDP'd into the same terminal server. The attacker can create a named pipe that takes over the, the GUID for the main uh, named pipe of the RDP uh, session mm-hmm. handling or the TCP handling of that TSV pipe handling. And they can man in the middle and view all the rest of the clipboard traffic hitting that name pipe for that service. Just but the clipboard. They, just the clipboard traffic, but they're pivoting that to other things beyond the clipboard? Correct. So you can do you can do interesting stuff with that because you're able to uh, because you have access to that, um, you're you're able to create instances that allow you to assume uh, assume identities. And so you can kind of start to gain uh, things coming across. Like uh, uh, one example that they actually have, uh, and more closer, closely related to how we did stuff, was uh, they're using the RDP DR, which is the um, uh, it connects hardware in your RDP system. So if you mount yep. a, a USB drive, drive or yep. a printer or USB, so you're able to man in the middle and take over and capture those objects as as part of that session. And therefore, you assume, you know, whatever, say it's a drive, you're able to assume that drive access and identity to access the data with inside of that. Or maybe fi- that's specific a, to a, a file share, too. Can't you? A file share. There's a file share you, you can do as a You can do file share, you yep. do printers. They did a smart card, and mm-hmm. they were able to capture the input output and the pin uh, for that smart card as part that's of terrifying. being able to grab that. So if you think about some of the things that rely on smart card and smart card over RDP, which is one of the fundamental ways that RDP is protected in highly uh, secure environments. Right. Yep. Yep. Now, now you're talking about a very, very bad piece of, of thing. But the RDP and RDP clipboard and RDP session, the way that the name pipe is handled, they're, they've issued a patch and uh, Microsoft has it out there. But it is very, very interesting how these things are, are not protected because there's even things like uh, credential guard that rely on these kind of name pipes or past access um, past access 
brokers is kind of how how it works. So it's it's pretty bad what you could do with this. Um, not just the clipboard because that that's bad too. But you think about passwords and and uh, things like you know LastPass or any of the password managers. You're copying those to a clipboard. Sometimes a secure clipboard. Sometimes not. Um, or passwords out of password vaults, uh, IPs, code, usernames. There's a lot of stuff that gets copied and pasted. Um, but even past that, the hardware access that provides some seriously, uh, seriously dangerous things you can do. And it's pretty trivial because it's just using name named pipes and taking over the GUID for the name pipe. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm I'm thinking if you're man in the middle, we've got to somehow get get the user to connect using your bogus service. But once you're in there, damn. No, 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 man in the no no user interaction because you're taking over a named pipe GUID. You actually are start restarting the service, assuming the GUID ID, and right. all you all you have to do is listen on that that name pipe with you know the proper I, proper. But you've got tool. to get on my server to do it, right? Yeah, you have you to do. have access to the host where people are. Yeah, so it is a privilege es yep. privilege escalation and, and information disclosure is probably how I would how I would categorize right. it. Well, do you need administrator privileges to access that nope. name pipe? Okay, so you just any that, other. User. That's the other big problem. Yeah, which if there's that's where tiering comes in. Like yep. if you're an administrator on there and you have a normal user on there, the normal user can assume whatever access whatever users are uh, essentially in that that tier that is accessing that server. So obviously privilege of escalation if you're not doing tiering correctly. Um, I wanted to talk about a, the hacking group that accidentally infected itself <laughs> with the remote access Trojan. Cause yes. they got great. Talk about having a bad <laughs> day, right? Phishing campaign. They're deploying uh, malware over it. However, uh, the article says it was discovered that the hacking group had managed to also infect its own development machine and the rat had captured the criminal's own keystrokes alongside screenshots of their own computers. They pwned themselves, <laughs> literally. It is, it is funny, Paul, but it's kind of I'm like doing a, uh, it. This came from Grand Paul's kind Blue. of like doing a what, rogue Wi-Fi challenge uh, where you stand up an access point called Sans Rogue Capital O One, mm. and you pwn yourself for several hours during the challenge. And don't win. Oh, you did that. Ooh, that was yeah. no. We did that. In 2005, we did that. Yep. First run of 617, and Josh gave us a leg up, said, this is what the challenge is going to be. And we decided to get sneaky and stand up our own rogue X point with a font collision. And the problem is, is that we forgot to uh, deny list that in Kismet, and we followed it ourselves for several hours. That we did. Oops. I forgot about that. Yep. I'm gonna say like every almost every pen tester's done this though. Like you, you develop, you're testing your code, you're looking for detection, you, you're doing it in a VM, hopefully. <laughs> or the, the wrong uh, VM. some of the the wrong VM. That some of the clues that they left behind were great though. I mean how uh, some of the the paths they didn't strip out of OLE, um, but it, it is kind of powerful. I think it's funny because this hacking group is notorious for interesting things, and and their name. A couple of their nicknames uh, kind of allude to that. The their uh, what is it, Hangover Group, and Dropping Elephant. So th they've got some funny names as far as I'm. I'm not sure that they're top top shelf. Well, yeah, I or, also think they're sloppy care. too because in order to recognize this, someone would have had to gain access. Sound like Malwarebytes researchers gained access to their C2 yep. infrastructure, <laughs> and then so that was like mistake number one. Even before they pwned themselves. They let you know researchers access to their infrastructure. I mean, most of us have probably stumbled across someone else's botnet or C two infrastructure, and I mean, not I mean, taking control is you know we have access to it. Like, oh, I can see all the bots that you deployed because I'm connected to whatever infrastructure you created for that. And in that investigation, they were like, oh, look, they pwned themselves, and here are the evil bad people's computers and their screenshots and all of the stuff the malware was collecting. Yeah, uh, ironically, I think it is funny because we we are very very uh, anti hackback and very, you know, anti go after the bad guys. But you read a lot of the research, the good research, and the people that you know keep the threat intelligence speeds up. That that yeah, know how, how things are it. happening. That's how they get they, it. They they have access. Uh, I I definitely talked about this on the show before, but you know, one of the I, I early in my career at the university. 
I stumbled across uh, attacker infrastructure and I noticed they had left around like their uh, credentials for the FTP sites where they were storing all of their tools and stuff. And I collected that and then cooperated with law enforcement. I actually did a presentation on it way back in the day. Um, and, and that's another example of, and that's the best intelligence, right? That, that we can get is actually, I mean, malware or access to the attacker infrastructure is some of the best intelligence out there. I mean, between like the very, very amazing data from very large data sources of, of different connected data points and, and traffic analysis, like other than that, looking into the uh, the attack infrastructure and even the hosting providers and, and some of their access into some of the infrastructure, that's how we are able to shut down mass botnets and no yeah. interconnectability between all of the, the different groups and, and stuff. So it takes it takes a lot of coordinated effort and there's a lot of probably liability and back-end conversations, but you kind of have to play at that dirty level to mm. do real damage to some of these, these um, nation states or even threat actor groups. Mm. Agreed. Now, Tyler, I know you've looked into uh, bypassing TPM chips and BitLocker uh, and bus pirate type style attacks, right? Because the so Microsoft is supporting the Pluton chip, which is putting from what I gathered from this article is putting like rather than being multiple chips that communicate in a bus to implement the physical security measures, this is all on the CPU die, which makes it yes. like next to impossible. I won't say impossible because like this sounds like a challenge because they're like Pluton is designed to fix all of those kind of bus uh, interception issues and it's integrated on the CPU die where it stores crypto keys and other secrets in a walled off garden that is completely isolated from other system components. Microsoft said data stored there can't be removed even when an attacker has installed malware or has full physical possession of the PC. To me, this sounds like a challenge. I think it's a much harder challenge from the way it was implemented previously. It's it's a it's pretty awesome. Like the level of security that they went. Not only that, but the the firmware and the software integration pack packages for like SDK and how drivers interact with these bus level uh, chips on die becomes very it becomes very difficult to attack. You're talking about software guard extensions at the die level that is integrating across a protocol that is exchanging keys to even exchange communications, and that's at the CPU. So, I mean, Larry, Larry's done a ton of this where you've got to get under microscopes and, and mm. start to peel these layers back and look at this stuff. That won't even help you in, in these cases because of where the firmware is sitting on the die and how the communication and the keys are being passed just for inner chip communication. That's not even inner bus. So there, there's no point of attack from even a really good adversary and, and some very... You'd have to be specter level meltdown kind of area to get any of that, and that would be basically encrypted data at that point because of of the protocols on top of the chip that's already in a single platform. So it's pretty cool how Intel and and security and, and even Windows integration, how Windows 11 is starting to integrate the OS TPM restrictions for validating. Uh, the integrity of your secure boot code and, and even memory address locations, virtualizing and, and protecting those memory address locations via um, some of these secure implementations of, of UFEI BIOS, secure boot, TPM, um, BDC, and, and BitLocker. All those things come into play at the pre-boot level and integrate into the operating system as protections and mechanisms for the OS to leverage things like Credential Guard, where you go to like something passwordless that's leveraging uh, you know, OAuth or SAML, and, and you've got TPM keys used to generate uh, seeds and stuff uh, that's not even a password in memory on a process. Like those, That's when it gets very, very difficult to start to have to break some of these protocols and, and security implementations. Um shenanigans fake uh -oh. sometimes hacking is as easy as a sticker with a qr code on it <laughs> oh my gosh we've been saying this for years though right Have, has everyone right. not been saying bar barcodes and qr codes are the, one of the simplest and, and craziest ways you could break an entire food chain store or 
there was like a parking, there was like a time mission. where like QR codes got really popular, and I remember being at a DefCon at the Rio. Maybe it was what was before the Rio. Uh, Riviera. Riviera. It might have been a Riviera where there was just QR Riviera. codes like plastered everywhere. And I was like, you just want to shut, shut your cameras off. I was like, hell no, I am not. I am at DEF CON. I am not going to a QR code. That is either going to be goatsy or potentially something worse, right? Well, do you think about the, so the things that people don't think about with QR codes is all the things that scan these. Like you, you started talking about like license print or license plate readers or security cameras in a mm. store. You have QR codes that have, say, something like log4j vulnerabilities that, that goes to, you know, an exploit page. And all, all the camera has to do is have smart recognition, AI or, or any of the smart recognition that scans a QR code and does some, you know, rendering or analysis on that. And that's a bad day. The pandemic also brought forth menus at restaurants were, like, no longer oh, a thing. Oh, gosh. And it's oh, QR yeah. code. And it's fucking horrible. Yes. I've, I mean, like, can you just give me a menu? Like, seriously? Because like, their online menus are horrible. Their web page is horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. The whole thing it's is horrible. horrible. And I, I don't know. I, I think we could bring up like 15 plus different studies that talk about how long COVID-19 lives on surfaces. And if it does, or, or how, tra how transmissible is it that? Yeah. Is it, it, I'm, I'm still touching the fork and the plate and the, like, it, there's no salt and pepper shakers at restaurants and you can, like, ask for it. Like, because you might catch co I, I can't. I, and I don't know. The, we could have a whole discussion about what you've read about COVID-19 and how you could find dozens of studies that talk about like either talking point. And like, what do you, what do you believe? I, I, I don't get it. In any case, fake QR codes on parking meters. So, yeah. And like, this wasn't just like someone who went to like a dozen or so parking meters, slapped a QR code on there. And it was like, hey, to like make your payment, like just scan this code with your phone and brought them to a fake payment site, collected the payment. You weren't paying your parking meter. You were paying whoever put that sticker on that on that parking meter, which I think is, I mean, I, it's pretty brilliant. brilliant. Like it's simple, but it works. Like that's, that's a really cool, made. that's a cool it hack. Made. It's totally illegal and you shouldn't do that kind of crap, but it's a cool hack. But they didn't. They did this to like a hundred, over a hundred parking meters in the city of Austin. Like that's dedication. What is that? Twenty nine dollars on Sticker Mule. Yeah. You wonder that's how much good they return have? on return on investment. <laughs> I mean, eventually you're going to get caught. Like it's it's not a long like it doesn't the hack doesn't have longevity because <laughs> you're going to get caught. I haven't seen anybody. I haven't seen news on on anybody getting caught in it yet, which is interesting because they yeah. had to set up like infrastructure. The payments have to go somewhere. A lot of that's usually tracked. I'm wondering right. if it's under a limit uh, in which you know FBI or local law enforcement doesn't push it up. Like they must must have estimated it at under twenty five thousand. And they're not going after those people. Yeah, which is interesting. They're not going after those people potentially. I don't. Ransomware, man. I mean, you're right. I mean, they're going to catch you on a camera, which may or may not be, you know, really good evidence these days, depending on your camera and all that stuff and wearing a mask and all that stuff. But still, like, there's evidence there. But, you know, to your point, you follow the money. Like, where where was it going? You're going to be able to trace it back somehow. It depends on what kind of wallet you have. If it's big, I mean, maybe it wasn't Bitcoin, but it, it's got to be traceable in some capacity. Let's say, is it, can you pay your parking ticket in cryptocurrency now? In Austin? I, I mean, if there's any city that you could, I bet you Austin would be on that list. It'd be on my list of cities, you know, San Francisco, yeah. Austin, New York, maybe Boston. I think it, I think it is kind of funny. I, I'm interested to see this one through. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on it because I'd like, did they use mules to put the stickers on? Did they pay someone to slap a sticker on there? Like. How smart really were they? Because it's kind of it's kind of an interesting. It's low key enough that you're making some money, and it's it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good tech, honestly. It's not like horrible hacking. Right. It's going to be some college students. Uh, Larry, I, I I have to talk about this article because I did I did see something about this. Uh, that there was. A 90 day fiance star. I didn't, I don't know what 90 day fiance is, and I didn't know that it had it's stars. TV, it's a reality TV show. I, I use the term star here loosely. <laughs> right. it, it's, it, she, she's a reality TV show star. 
Gotcha. We'll, that, give, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll give her that. We'll give her that. Uh, sure. I, I'll, let's put it this way. All I know about the TV show I learned from Josh Wright, who's a huge fan. Interesting. Uh huh. Interesting. Um, so we, we but, don't judge here. We but judge apparently, here. so you're a star on a reality TV show, and you need to supplement your income. And somehow she came to this point where she was farting in a jar and selling it. Yeah, my my understanding was yeah. that there was some like joke that one of her fans said, "Oh my God, if you farted in a jar, I'd, I'd buy, buy it, it for three hundred dollars." And apparently, they weren't the only one. Does that actually now? Now I I don't want to entice our audience to test this theory, but like my question, being a hacker, especially, like, does that really work? <laughs> and like, how long does the the fart last? Is it a special jar? Do you need a special kind of seal on it? I have a lot of apparently questions. Apparently, you need a lot, of, but apparently, you need a lot of farts because at fifty thousand dollars a week. That's a lot of what? jars and a lot of farts. What? She was making fifty grand a week. She yep. was selling more than one. Yeah. Yeah. She was eating a yeah, lot of beans. Just... A lot of beans. Well, yeah. well, well that's that's, that's kind it. of the thing. Go ahead, Lee. What? Lee. I mean, she she didn't she go to the hospital because her 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 insides couldn't take all the beans and other stuff she was using for the continuous flatulence and just. Yep. Yep, I like how you use the correct. Going to the hospital because she thought she was having a heart attack, because her diet meant that her body was producing so much gas that she couldn't let it out. I like how I like how Lee repeat without squirming in the chair. I like how Lee used correct (laughs) medical terminology. Continuous flatulence (laughs) was a phrase that was said on the show. I want to point that out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Culture. (laughs) This lady should be fired up a storm. (laughs) <laughs> this is a stupid thing with all these like TikToks and, and YouTubers who make a lot of money. Like we have brilliant scientists that spend fifty years to f- figure out MRI, computer yeah. shit and quantum right. quantum mechanics, and, and the, you know they make very little money, and no one's heard of them. And yet these stupid YouTube people and other people are making fifty thousand dollars a week. Like farting takes us twenty jar. years to get where we're at, and they fart in a jar. Yeah. Stupid. T- Tyler, clearly, I'm regretting some of my life <sighs> choices right about now. You because no. I too could have been making fifty grand a week for farting in a jar and probably just with my regular diet. You have a lot of flatulence, Larry. I mean, you should have been capturing that stuff. Right. <laughs> like, if I had a nickel for every time I farted in a jar, like, <laughs> she was getting three hundred bucks though. Not just I know. a nickel. Larry's know. a bargain. I'm, still- <laughs> I'm going to Larry's <laughs> fart in a jar shop. <laughs> yeah, but to make it to make matters even worse. To or or to you know, make this even more absurd, my understanding is that she's retired from jar farting, and now she's selling NFTs of farts in a jar. What? That is yeah, like just when I thought the story couldn't get any more ridiculous, it just got I more actually ridiculous. Was going to make a joke about that, and now it's just stupid. It's oh worse. man, we needed this. It's, it's it seems like a very fortuitous development. I mean, fortuitous <laughs> development. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <sighs> wow! I can't believe yeah. we're breaking the story here. I mean, how did this? How did? How does this headline not catch your attention, though? Yeah. That I mean, because we're all because we're eight year old boys. I mean, you had us at fart, right? It's true. Uh-huh. The fact that we asked questions. I think it was. Wendy Nather, when I was catching up with her, we we're talking about hackers, and she said, I said, we're all kind of scientists. And she said, yeah, we're scientists, but like toddler scientists. <laughs> 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 and I'm kind of thinking that goes along with the story. Like, the scientist in me is like, if I fart in a jar, how long does the smell last inside of the jar? What's, what's the seal? Is there an easy technology to actually make this one way and a, right. know, and a if, bi-directional could, valve? And if I, if it's the jar that's like you know the canning, if it, you do a lot of canning mm-hmm. stuff, Larry, mason, right? Yeah. Ma- the mason jar, but you put yeah. also a piece. Of, uh, the ones you brought in, not farts, but like other things that you can for us <laughs> you put like a piece of cloth and then you seal it or a piece of plastic right and then you screw the yep. top on and seal it like does that make no. it make the fart last longer and if so how much longer are you, you drug dealer are you, are you cutting the fart the jar, with air? Right? The post- 
<laughs> yeah, and if you put something in the jar to maintain the smell, that's another interesting. Mm -hmm. If this is science, it, like, like, do you need a fart preservative? Yes, yes. Can she's making like, fifty thousand dollars a week, and there's people researchers use electrical magnetic magnetic signals to classify malware infecting IoT by like. How is that not worth fifty thousand dollars a week? See, but in both cases, we're talking about science, Tyler. That's oh. what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Hackers have this series of hypotheses that we we have to test at all times, and we can apply that to. See, we're thinking about that. She wasn't thinking about that. Her science brain was mm -mm. not not that far developed. It was I can fart yeah. in a jar, and her, someone's going to pay her, me money. Like there was no her, science. Her science brain. Her science brain was how can I fart more? Right. Yeah. Apparently, obviously, she didn't even she didn't even science that right because she didn't understand the limits of her physical capabilities that she's selling. It's stupid. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't even know. I don't even know where you go. <laughs> she believes to, to, to quote George there's a Carlin, picture of her in the hospital. Yeah, fart, uh, to quote George Carlin, farts are cute. Farts are fun. Farts are shit without the mess. She believed <laughs> there were symptoms of a heart attack or stroke, but doctors confirmed the result of eating too much eggs and beans. She was on WebMD, obviously. Wow. Craziness. I don't know how we follow that up. I don't think we do. Do we? I don't, maybe that's where we stop. I think so. All well, right. Good to be back in the saddle for a show of the new year. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening and, lo and watching. Larry, fart us out. I mean, take us out. <laughs> Over and out. God.